So welcome back. So how was it? How did it go? Did you enjoy it? Oh, I got to listen in, and I know there's some fabulous work going on. So I think we're going to have some career switching after this session. I just wanted to, you know, I heard a comment in one of the groups um, by someone, I can't lay my eyes on him right now, who said that, and I, I assume he was referring to 2012 and all of the predictions, oh, here you are, around um, December 21st. But the fact that we're actually moving into a new era, that humanity is going through an enormous shift. And we're moving into a time when people anticipate um, more harmony, um, greater peace, a uh, lot more of a sense of connection among human beings around the world, and that the actual stories we tell each other may be different. They may be transformational stories. They may be stories of awakening. Um, they may be slightly different stories. But while we're still on this side of uh, December 21st, 2012, we can go back to the conflict and resolution of that conflict. And so we'd like to invite you one by one to come up and share the story that your group created. And I think we'll start, well, we'll take a volunteer from the four groups. Who would like to be number one? Yeah. No, we're at number three. So our uh, research came from Dr. Fernandez, and it was about uh, qualitative research on attitudes and knowledge about HPV among men and women in the US-Mexico border. So our story starts out with Maria, who has just come from the doctor, and she learns that she's HPV positive. So the first thing she does is she goes to see her friend Carmen to tell her because she's very upset. And so she, Maria and Carmen decide that they're going to Google it, and they're going to figure out what's going on. And so when they're Googling it, they get very upset because they see that it's linked to cervical cancer. And so Maria is afraid that she has cancer and she's going to die. And then they see that HPV is sexually transmitted and that's where the drama begins. So Maria and Carmen then begin to wonder if Maria's husband Pedro has been faithful to her. So they decide that they're going to figure out their sexual histories to see how they could have been exposed. So the camera sees each of them making their lists, and Maria makes a very short list, but it has more than one person on it. And uh, Carmen's list is a little bit longer, and she doesn't show Maria that Pedro is on that list. Yeah. So then they keep Googling, because Carmen's starting to sweat. So then she tries to convince Maria that HPV is also transmitted without sexual intercourse, or maybe she got it not from having sex. Maybe she got it a long time ago from a different partner. Um, so then Maria keeps Googling on her own, and she reads about the vinegar tests. So she decides she's going to try a vinegar test on Pedro. The, the vinegar test. Yeah, so for VIA, when you when you apply vinegar to the cervix, the, the abnormal lesions, the abnormal cells turn white. So Maria decides she's gonna do this for Pedro, so she gets Pedro drunk. And then when Pedro is drunk, she tries her own vinegar test on him, but it comes up positive. And so Maria then calls Carmen to tell her, and she's very upset. Uh, so then Carmen calls Pedro, because now she is very upset, and she's convinced that she has HPV, and she's going to die, and she doesn't care about the secret affair anymore. So Carmen is now fighting with Pedro. Well, then Maria is really mad and confronts Pedro, and they have a big fight, and Pedro gets mad and blames Maria and says that she was cheating, and that's how she got it. So then Maria goes for her follow-up appointment, because when she initially went to the doctor, they gave her a referral to an OBGYN for for further consultation. So then Maria goes to the doctor and the doctor says that she needs to, that Maria needs to speak with Pedro or that the doctor is happy to speak with Pedro as well, but he needs to know some information about it. And he tells Maria that she does not have cancer, that she needs to have continued screening and be followed up over time, that she is an HPV carrier, and that regular PAPs can help monitor the changes that she'll have from HPV, and that males can pass the virus to women. Uh, the doctor says that he cannot prove fidelity or infidelity with virus transmission and that she could have gotten it from a previous relationship and had the, the virus for many years and just now is having cervical changes. Uh, the doctor then reinforces the importance of screening. And then I added this little part at the end without the group. As Maria leaves the appointment, she makes her follow-up appointment for her next pap. Ha, <laughs> 
<laughs> That's actually my worst fear, is that I go to the doctor for an ER visit, and it's a really attractive doctor. That's like, <laughs> it makes women anxious. It's actually Everybody's a bad thing. Everybody's very attractive, of course. Can you hear me? OK. Everybody has a mic here. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to offer some constructive feedback on your story. And who would like to start? I'm going to start by saying I have no notes. I thought it was brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> that was Sarah's group, of course. <laughs> OK, what about the others? Sorry, I'm trying to. You can just talk. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it was terrific. The, 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 oh, is it on now? Hello, OK. I'm not very technologically savvy. Um, I thought the, the, the level of detail was terrific, that you guys got got such a huge arc of a, of a story. I think the, the details such as you know, that, that she Googled something, that they, that they you know, found a, a vinegar test, that that's, that's a, some nice, juicy details, um, I thought it was terrific. I thought it was great. I, I got a little lost in the middle <laughs> because there were so many details. But um, I'm sure when, when it was actually fully fleshed out as a story, it would be engaging and lovely. That's the thing I liked most about it was, although it's obviously a very serious story, that it, it's funny much of the way through. I mean, you, what you ended up doing was finding ways of lightening this up and feeling like we weren't learning a lesson. We were, you know, so I thought that was really, it was really good. The show. I liked that it was um, entertainment first. So it was much more about the story and these incredible characters and the ins and outs and the passions and the fears. And the education was second. And yet, it, I'm sure it would be very powerfully conveyed because you'd have uh, the audience invested in and rooting for, as Joanne um, said, rooting for you know, these characters to succeed at their goals. So I think you did an amazing job. It was a group effort and I just based in a real story. Yeah, so. And well pitched, too. And I just want to point out, because um, I, I was saying to my group that this story started out, like so many of the stories we tell, is that a real doctor in our group told a story of a patient of his, and we were able to build from that. And so that's a lot what we do as storytellers is um, rip off your lives. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, so I'm Maria Fernandez. This was my article. And um, I, you know, one of the things, and it may not have come out in what was written there, that I thought was super interesting was that um, the men reacted um, uh, like immediately, sort of in this stereotypical chauvinistic attitude, like, oh, I can't believe my wife was cheating on me and that's why she had this. But then they quickly sort of turned when they got the information onto, oh my gosh, it could have been me. Right, and, mm -hmm. and so that's, that's the only thing, and of course I know way more background of, mm -hmm. of this study than, than you all probably had, but that's the, that's the only thing that I probably would have added to the story, because mm -hmm. I think it's a really interesting little point there. Great. And one of the things to know about working with storytellers is that you can give them the information, really inspire them with the real stories and the results of research, but you never get to tell them what story to tell, and we actually have no control over the final outcome. It's just an interesting thing about working, if you're working with Hollywood or Bollywood or Nollywood or really in any industry. I know we're not doing that, but I just thought it would be a little interesting point. You can offer it up and you can be an expert consultant, but in the end, they get to decide. So they may leave out a detail like that. So. OK, so now we have um, three more. Who would like to go next? Yes. Woohoo! group two, Woo! <laughs> So um, our article was actually about um, do no harm and re relating to the um, decreased screening interval. Uh, we decided to, uh, it was really hard actually to pick um, who we wanted the audience to be. But what we decided to do is make this a 35-year-old, relatively educated um, African-American woman who had just gotten into the uh, medical healthcare system for the first time in a few years. She's really excited about her new doctor. She's gone in, um, and she had her last pap a year ago. Um, and she gets her pap smear, and she goes home, and she's hanging out with her Caucasian friend. Um, and they get a, a phone call from the nurse who said, you know, everything was great. Your test was fine. You don't need to come back for five years. Um, and she kind of hangs up the phone and wondering, and she took, looks at her friend and says, you know, I, 
I, I just, I guess this is good. I, I mean, I, I'm only, I don't have to come back for five years and, my fr and her friend who has a different triage, um, uh, HPV positive, um, but she doesn't know that. Um, has to go back. She says, oh, I always have to come back every year. Um, and so all of a sudden there's kind of this distrust feeling that's going on where why do you have to go back every year and I don't have to go back for five years. It's like they, they don't really care about me. So she makes tries to make an appointment with her doctor um, and tries uh, hard to see if she can get back in and discuss it and she can't get an appointment. In the meantime, she's doing the Googling thing too and she's recognizing and talking with her friend about how you know she has multiple risk factors like she's, uh, smoke, she's a smoker, she, so we kind of get a little bit of education in there. She has a few partners, um, and that this is a totally preventable disease, and what do they mean that I don't have to come back for five years? So she she's kind of worked herself up into a frenzy, and she she finally says, I'm just going to go in and try to make an appointment with the doctor in person. And there's a character of a nurse receptionist who's somewhat funny, I guess, or, and stern and says, you can't go in. And she does something funky to distract her. And I think we hadn't decided if it was going to be a fire drill or she, she sneaks in or something and ends up storming well, they, into they the room. They both go together. Oh, they go. So the one's going to distract, Yeah, right? distract. And, and then she goes in and she storms into the doctor's office and she's very upset about, what do you mean I don't have to come back yearly? My friend it has to come back every year. Do you not care about me? She's very mistrustful. And the doctor sits down and in some calm way kind of acknowledges her, her fear of saying, you know, uh, and I don't remember if we decided this is the way it went or not, but, you know, my sister had uh, cervical cancer, and yes, I understand how worried you are about it, but that we have new technology. This is a, a, a disease that we have made leaps and bounds on. We have this new technology. We have a vaccine. We have this test that's so sensitive, and, um, uh, and this is, uh, the doctor explains this all to her and kind of goes through a little bit of instruction and she feels better, she leaves, and as she leaves, she texts her friend saying, it's okay, I don't have to go back for five years. So that's how we end it. And part of, the, part of the thing about the ending is that the doctor makes the analogy like, oh, you know, what did you like have five years ago? Like, what kind of cell phone did you have five years ago? Right. Did you have a smartphone? It's like that kind of technology. That's where we've come. And then, so, so we tied it together with the text together at the end. With the text. Text to her friend saying, it's all right. Okay, judges, uh, <laughs> who would like to start? Excellent. Cool. <laughs> Yay! No, I thought it was fun, and I like that you were able to find conflict and outrageousness in in a fairly straightforward story that you had the, the shenanigans of, of the conflict of getting in to see the doctor I thought was really yeah. fun. Because it's always fun to, people are going to connect so much more when there's active things going on and not just a patient talking to a doctor. Mm -hmm. Chris? Well, uh, I wanna, I'm hesitant to have any criticism because we're yet to go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I do want to say, and, and maybe I know less about this, but I want to make sure that one of the things that's complicated is to make sure that the things that you know as a, as a professional reflect the fears of a lay audience. And I, I wasn't sure hearing it, whether, for example, I understood why two friends, one says, I need to go every year, and the other one says, really, I'm fine, they don't want to see me in five years, why the person who's told she's fine goes nuts. Because um, my, my natural inclination would be, phew, what's wrong with you? And the person who had to go every one yeah, year would point. say, oh my god, what's going on? So I understand what the, per, what the, the argument needed to be from a medical professional point of view, mm -hmm. but from a lay person's point of view, I, I was a little confused, but just wait till we go. <laughs> I will say to defend us, I mean, the distrust thing was supposedly the, the reason why she suddenly got, you know, she had a kind of a distrust of the medical system okay, anyway, okay. So and reasons. so the, her, her white friend didn't have to go. It's like, you know, when I had to go to the hotel. Right. The pool. <laughs> the, the, the pool, I, was, I told the story right, right. about me going to the pool hotel and then asking for my card to get back there, and then when I went with them, suddenly I wasn't asked. <laughs> and I said, is it because I'm black? <laughs> and then there's a general mistrust there is a, in America. You know, there's a general mistrust. Uh, yeah, US because of Tuskegee anyway. and all that kind yes, of stuff. Right. So. Right. Turned out to be both that's where it comes Jews from. And African -American. <laughs> he had to get carded. <laughs> we didn't know. Yeah. So that's where that comes from. I mean. The other thing, too, to keep in mind is that, particularly with immigrant populations, there's different recommendations in each country. So when I was working in an FQHC with largely Hispanic populations in Indiana, they would come in and say, in Mexico, I have to get a PAP every six months because that's the general recommendation. Mm -hmm. And then ACOG had changed theirs. It's like, oh, in three years. And this is, again, a population that has very low health education yeah, we, we did decide this was only going to work in the US. Mm -hmm. um. <laughs> but that, that's, a, that's a good way. Our skin wellness book. And patients, 
patients. I'm having problems as a gynecologist with patients not liking less screening. Mm -hmm. So that actually, right. this whole scenario yeah. is very real. Of like, right. Oh my God, they're, they're not screening. They're trying to save money. They're not right. trying to do the standard and that's, care. And that's where I started So from. that's, this is very <laughs> realistic. Yeah, to yeah. The and we talked about the money spec aspect too, which we, we didn't include, but right. that would be part of the mistrust. I, I love that because uh, on a personal level, when we started telling this breast cancer story on Parenthood, I'm 36 years old and I was like, oh my God, I got to get a mammogram. And I called and um, did you know on our Writers Guild Health Insurance, uh, they don't cover a mammogram <laughs> until we're 40. And so it was again the like, why can't I have more screening if I demand it? Because now I'm paranoid because I've been writing about breast right. cancer all day. There are many free screening, ca uh, cancer screening <laughs> programs. That's not an excuse. So talk to me afterwards. <laughs> Okay, that's good. <clears throat> yeah. Jennifer, did you have any? I, 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 my group, my group hasn't gone yet, so I'm, 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 I'm saying we have a perfect ten for these. No, I, I agree with my genius compatriots who are much more uh, eloquent than I am. Terrific. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we've got our next group. <laughs> Hello. Oh wait, hold on. Hi. Okay. I have some, some information that is very important because you are giving uh, education to people through your programs. Is that less screening does not mean less visits to the doctor. It's just less screening for cervical cytology if uh, people between 30 and 65 get co testing. Co testing means pap smear and HPV DNA. If both turns negative, then you can increase the screening period between three and five years, depending on special circumstances. But remember that the most common cancer in the women is breast cancer. And sometimes with a clinical breast exam at the medical office may save life. So the regular visit still is present. But people are getting confused even in those cases that uh, my next appointment is in five years. Forget about that. Yeah, yeah. Is the the pap smear right. Scre yeah. just screening for the cervical uh, screening? But people clarity. clarity. <laughs> Has to be very. Clear. No, that's very important, and I would like your contact information um, when we finish because we get inquiries from writers literally seven days a week on medical topics, and if we get any questions around this, I'd like to be able to call you. Yeah, if and you remember that I speak Spanish too. That's yeah. that's <laughs> even better. And I will say that more clarity often comes through drafts. Yeah. You know, like. You know, this was Which actually a, is what we're doing here. The, what's being read is the first draft. The, mm -hmm. the conversation we're having here, if this were a writer's room, this would be what would get incorporated into the second draft and the third draft and the fourth draft. So this is a very common process. Yes. Yes. Okay. One last question. I just want to, to raise awareness about not dealing with um, HPV uh, positive you know, messaging and stuff the same way like we have been dealing with uh, HIV because it's, it's not the same at all. So it's like people don't have to say like, oh, I'm positive, oh, what's that? So I, I think that the experts in communication and the, where the evidence is about that, you, should, you really need to tailor that because it's not this at all the same epidemic. It's not at all the same, nothing. So maybe that's something that really needs to be revisited. Mm -hmm. Just that you don't have to do it at all. And then there's also some evidence from the introduction of the vaccine where, and of course it's in developed developing countries that um, they don't you refer to it as HPV because uh, people get confused with HIV. Uh, so they, they usually talk about the cervical cancer, the virus that causes cervical cancer and refer to cervical cancer however locally it is recognized. But it's very important that you, you know in media learn uh, how to deal with HPV. HPV has nothing to do with HIV, so don't, it's not that scary thing. Thank you. Okay, our next group. So in our group, we, um, we're dealing with uh, challenges faced by cervical cancer prevention programs in developing countries, in Argentina specifically, and it's uh, it being um, politically different, and uh, different provinces have, or federal, how do they call it? Well, different, Provinces, maybe they they have different regulations, and so it's very difficult to keep um, the testing 
in regulation and the problems with that. So we had a lot of um, concerns about sending the wrong messages and starting off with a, a negative message, but this is what we came up with. Um, a predatory younger doctor who um, basically exploits um, Argentine's history with Vita Peron dying of cervical cancer to um, emotionally get people to get tested and uh, sort of inflict fear in people and have everybody getting tested. Um, and then we also have a sort of our, our hero against this villain doctor um, who is in the same practice. She's a midwife. And they actually work together. But she's been in contact with this community that we're going to be in, in the scene and, and the families. And then we have this town where um, a lot of people are getting positive and there's this, all these young women who have been tested and all of a sudden there's this bizarre situation in a town where all the young women are sick or positive and, and the havoc that is created by this over-testing. And, and then also a generation of older women being afraid of uh, being tested. And we did not come up with a happy ending for this. Um, we were actually, uh, we had, a, we were advised to perhaps keep the story in a conflict where um, the hero tries to get uh, the idea across that you know over testing is not the way to do it, but actually doesn't have the power to confront the opportunistic doctor. And the town is turned upside down and it's in the wrong. And we basically are left with this um, image of a a town gone crazy with all the young women freaking out and the older women not wanting to be tested. And, um, but then we get to see that it's not the right way to do it. Perhaps on a next uh, situation, next town or next episode, we can see uh, the situation treated better. But in this town, we get to see the doctor who um, doesn't follow the guidelines. So our basic theme is testing needs to be done properly, improperly, uh, improperly done tests uh, create more problems instead of helping. <laughs> mm, very interesting. Um, do, would you like to comment on the material you had to work with? Uh, <gasps> yes. Well, it, was, it, was, it was difficult. Um, we, we resigned early in the process, but then we were convinced to go back to doing it. There were three problems, I think, in this story that we faced. First was that the message was both a positive and a negative message. In other words, it was an attempt in some ways to say that over 35, um, there should be uh, cervical cancer testing, but that there were risks to testing under, under that age, and that, in fact, those risks could undermine the entire program. That was problem number one, which was the fear of expressing a negative message, which is don't get tested. Um, the second thing was that the story was about the systemic problem, not necessarily the individual problem. That is to say, so it, it was not, even in the way it was described, it was talked about what would happen in a community or in a province in which all the wrong people were being tested, or too many people were being tested, and the system was being flooded. It made it very difficult to say, we'll just take a single person and tell that story because that single person wouldn't do that. The third thing is that it required a kind of span of time because the proof that if you are if you have a positive test at 21, that that might actually lead to complications. I mean, a behavior, a set of behaviors that were not necessary, and you could have waited until you were 35, is very difficult to tell in a brief period. So we we worked on this idea of talking about it in a kind of uh, like a, an Ibsen story of the, a, a community gone mad, um, a single hero who is undermined but tells the truth. And we're also talking the story about a single family with a, a lot of daughters, all of whom were tested too young, and an older generation who so freaked out by what was going on with the daughters didn't get tested. And so the wrong thing was happening. That it, was, it was not an easy story to tell. That was very well done, though. Well, you did a really, but this really is a good first job. draft. We still have five or six more meetings before we get to the actual story. <laughs> but, but this points to, to something that happens a lot in, in television writing, that there are stories that you can tell over one episode, and there are stories that require a three-episode arc, a six-episode arc, because you need not just time passage, but, but you need for more complicated issues to be, to be fed out in smaller bits of information. So because Chris is the president of the Writers Guild, that we decided we would give him the most difficult <laughs> topic. So um, 
that's that's why uh, that, that's why he got the one that that didn't have the the easiest story to lay out. But it it's instructive to look at when you're when you're looking at ways to tell stories. Not every story falls neatly into a one minute or two minute category, and that doesn't mean you've done a bad job with the story. It just means some stories need more time to be parsed out. And I would say a note to think about for the next pass, the next draft, is motivation. Because you talk about the anta antagonist doctor, and you know people are generally not evil just for the sake of being evil. Well, we, um, yeah, He's why are you pointing to me? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like, like yourself. You know, in fact, we, we, we did talk about that. They, then we had the conversation that, that there is a profit motivation, in oh, fact, yeah. in this case. Done. That he okay, actually yeah. does very, very well when everyone gets tested. And Great. so he's a, he's a very aggressive yeah, doctor who uses the, the, that, the myth, not the myth, the truth of the national myth of Eva, Eva Perone to cause a kind of And also general... the idea that he's promoting something that's good for everybody, which is right. true. He's promoting something that's good and, and the technology is positive. Right. But if you abuse it, it becomes, you know, counterproductive. So counterproductive. So. I like the, the, um, the MD nurse provider conflict too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, said, yeah. I liked the um, the conflict between a physician and a nurse, <laughs> too. That was sort of interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the members because of the, they are the becoming, group, you know, really the nurse midwives really are sort of the, the advocates, and but I don't know if we'd want to promote that completely. But I, I like that. It's interesting. Okay. I think there's a, a, a lot of places to go with that that character, which is very interesting to me, like the opportunistic doctor, like he's kind of the uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde mm -hmm. kind of thing, like he's one thing on the surface and then he's like in his laboratory. You know, um, <laughs> so I, I'm going to add, the, the other day I went to see Patch Adams, he had an, uh, a conference here, and he was talking to the younger doctors, the people that are studying or uh, the community that was there, and talking about, you know, the 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 usage now of people just wanting to go into a specialty just to have a, make more money or you know sort of a tendency in the medical field and and that's that's where I thought well you know that could happen you know you have a young doctor who's like very gung ho professional he wants to be like you know it's it, he starts with a good intention perhaps you know but it it eats at his at his way of making decisions and he ends up just getting a little too um you know, exploitative of the situation, perhaps? This could be a whole series. Yeah. It is. Okay. It is a series. All right, I, we're going to have to. It will be on ABC I next year. I have to say, I'm also a big fan of a twist, so the other direction you could go is that the whole time you're thinking, oh, that's this evil doctor and overtesting for profit, and then the twist at the end is you sort of find out, no, he's, he's got a really good reason, and maybe it's something personal, or maybe it's this Ava Perone story, something like that. Yeah, his wife died. A personal story is always great. Okay, this is fantastic. Thank you so much. Woo! Group three! Woohoo! Okay, next group. <laughs> okay, so our group um, had to deal with the story of um, to vaccinate or not to vaccinate is vaccinating safe. And the setting is a living room, and it's right after the funeral of a 14-year-old girl. Um, and there have been eight deaths related to, there have been eight deaths um, that have not been related to, there's just been eight deaths. <laughs> um, eight deaths of girls after being vaccinated. And this is in India. So girl number one, Suri, um, who's in the scene, has not been vaccinated, and girl number two, Kala, was vaccinated. And Suri's parents are there, Bob, for lack of a better name. <laughs> <laughs> we need a more culturally sensitive name, but so it's toast Bob. So Bob is against vaccinating his daughter, Suri, and Joan, Dr. Joan, is for vaccinating their daughter. So Joan is a doctor just in case. And the plot point is Joan says, you know, Des, Joan uh, clarifies that deaths are unrelated to HPV vaccination, but cervical cancer killed Bob's sister. So you should let our daughter get vaccinated. And this is the order, this is the sequence. Um, Kala worries she may die since she was vaccinated. And Kala's father is concerned, you know, did I do the right thing? Was I too um, 
you know, too quick to make the decision of having my daughter get vaccinated. And that's pretty much what is, you know, going on in his mind. And Dr. Joan, you know, is the one they are clarifying, you know, these girls did not die of consequences related to being vaccinated. So Bob, the father of Suri, who was vaccinated, is, you know, kind of struggling and saying, you know, my daughter, you know, will not die from getting this vaccine. You know, our daughter is not sexually active. She's not promiscuous. Why would she need to get vaccinated? And Suri, which is the daughter, says, you know, Dad, your sister died of cervical cancer. I saw her live in struggle with this. I should be vaccinated. And Dr. So, you know, and Dr. Joan is there saying, well, it is true. You know, if she had had the vaccine, perhaps she could have lived. We need to support the HPV vaccine. More women will live. And in the end, Suri asks her dad to get vaccinated. And the closing scene is, you know, dad taking Suri to get vaccinated. That's the end. Bravo. Bravo. That's a, a little bit um, strawberry, but, you know, not as, it's not as simple in the real world, but that's the message we wanted to, to convey. That's great, but that's what TV is. It's simplifying it and f everything we talked about, clarity, conciseness, focus. And what I really liked was that everybody had personal stakes and that they were different and that everybody was bringing their experiences into their decision making. And that's what character is. Character is all your backstories motivating you to do things. So I, I thought it was great. And I love the sweet ending. Very visual and beautiful. Stars for team number three. <laughs> the, um, the, the interesting thing about working with this, with this group was that it, it, was, it, it was a good uh, instruction in clarity and focus because the bulk of the material we had was information about the World Health Organization stake versus the stake that a, a pediatrician in a New Delhi hospital had taken. And it was a lot of, it was important information, but it was very dry and ultimately not what we needed. And there were paragraphs about, you know, would this study have collateral damage in other countries? And the group decided that while these were all important points, the way to hook people in was to make it personal, was, was to give the girl's point of view on this, of their fear of their classmate who had died, and oh my god, is that going to happen to me? And the parents' fear of both death of their kid, am I doing the right thing for the child? So we, we actually chucked a big portion of our information because it was just information. It wasn't story. And it, was, it, it sort of goes back to what we were talking about with the first exercises, where you have all sorts of things. We could have taken the story any number of ways, but once we decided to make it personal and make it more be grounded in what was happening to these 14-year-old girls, that gave us the focus and that gave us the leeway to, to get rid of a lot of things that if we were presenting this for an adult audience, we would have included. The only information we had was that the eight women did, the eight girls did die after the vaccine, but it was proven that it was not related to the vaccine. There were eight girls out of 23,000, mm -hmm. so there were other reasons for them. Well, that, yeah, right. I, I, like, sort of what I really liked about the story, because we deal with this deal with this on all kinds of issues and vaccination in the United States is to try to talk to people about the difference between correlation and causality without actually having that conversation. This seemed to me a good dramatization of that question. Well, actually, I was, I was wondering if there is a way to actually dramatize that more. Mm -hmm. You know, just the fact that when I think it was the, the mother who said that this wasn't caused by that, but to have her like somehow dramatically show that you know, like take out things and just we, we had a lot of discussion about that because they didn't give us any facts about what those eight girls had actually had died of. And there, but there was discussion about saying, did this one die of you know alcohol poisoning? Did this one of giving other points of view? Because you're right, you do wonder that. But we, yeah, I thought that was really interesting. Mm -hmm. The group fell in love with the, the emotional family component, right. and I which I really liked. That. Yeah. <laughs> I think you all did an amazing job. I think we should give you a round of applause. So 
Our concluding slide is the creativity takes courage, and you were all incredibly courageous today. This was amazing.